Okay, here we go. Terrific. I have Professor Tom Berman with me. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to this conversation on exploring the Quran and the Bible. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's really great to have you as a colleague at Notre Dame. I'll give a sort of formal introduction in a moment to Professor Berman. Um, but, you know, informally, we're colleagues here at Notre Dame. We're in my office in Malloy Hall at Notre Dame. And uh, I think your office is sort of across, across the way in the building that has a mural known as Touchdown Jesus. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to cover all sorts of topics that um, uh, deal with the translation of the Qur'an from Arabic into, into Latin, um, generally uh, medieval uh, uh, European Christian dispositions and attitudes towards Islam and the Qur'an, and it's going to be really great. So stay with us. Don't just watch for two minutes or three minutes or four minutes. Watch to the end. Okay, so here we go. We'll have a, a formal introduction, and then we'll get into the conversation with Professor Berman. So, everyone, uh, friends, uh, Thomas E. Berman became the Robert Conway Director of the Medieval Institute and Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame in 2017. After teaching at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, for 25 years, he is the author of Religious Polemic and the Intellectual History of the Mose Arabs from 1050 to 1200, that's with Brill, published in 1994. Reading the Quran in Latin Christendom between 1140 and 1560, published with the University of Pennsylvania Press, and we'll be speaking about the ideas in that book today. And, very recently, with Brian Katlos and Mark Meyerson, The Sea in the Middle, Mediterranean Civilization, 650 to 1650, that's with the University of California Press. And uh, is that a textbook, uh, Tom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Great. And then... Uh, then there's texts from the middle, documents from the Mediterranean world from the same time period and same press, which makes me think that that's um, basically a source book that accompanies. That's precisely what it is, yes. Yeah, great. Uh, and I think, because I heard you present here at Notre Dame recently, that you're also working on a project in regard to the correspondence between, uh, maybe more complicated than that, but between uh, the Byzantine Emperor Leo III and the Umayyad Caliph Omar II. That's absolutely right as well, yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Well, maybe we'll get a chance to speak yeah. about that. Um, why don't I start just with a general question. Could you tell us about how you entered in the field of medieval studies generally, but more particularly gained interest in the question of the translation of the Quran and the Quran's place in medieval European civilization? Yeah, well, it's uh, <clears throat> always a complicated answer to how you got into something like this. Um, I guess I, I became interested in the Middle Ages uh, at uh, quite a young age, uh, actually, my one one of my earliest memories of that fascination had to do with reading a book that maybe others my age uh, read uh, called called um, uh, the Story of Mankind, which was an adolescent history of the world written by a guy named Hendrik Van Loon, you know, way back in the thirties and. Um, I remember sitting in the library, the local library where I grew up, uh, reading that and being just kind of fascinated by this mm. whole notion mm. of the Middle Ages. Mm. But then uh, <clears throat> I went on uh, to college and um, in my second year took a course in medieval European history and sort of immediately really took to it and uh, having been shaped like so many people um, in... Uh, <laughs> all over the place by things like the Lord of the Rings and and other kind of romantic mm -hmm. presentations mm -hmm. of the Middle Ages right. that combined with this early fascination and then and then um, a kind of a fascination with this period that um, in some ways is such a different world it, 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 you know we, we talk about the past being a foreign country and the Middle Ages is in some ways a foreign country mm -hmm. but there are all kinds of ways in which I immediately felt as well that the Middle Ages is uh, in some way still living on with us right now, mm -hmm. and that combination of distance and, and proximity um, I really found compelling. Um, I decided after a year, uh, 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 the year after I graduated uh, from college that I wanted to go on into graduate study of the Middle Ages, and um, I went to the University of Toronto partly because of the large program it has right. and, and still right. has uh, in, in medieval studies, 
but partly because there was a historian of medieval Spain there named uh, J.N. Hilgarth, and um, I had done a double major in history and Spanish okay. as an undergraduate, and okay. so it kind of made sense to work on medieval Spain. Um, and it was really out of um, sort of my first diggings around in um, thinking about what I was interested in uh, and writing about the Arabic-speaking Christians of Spain in my first book that I came across something that I, I, I still remember vividly being sort of shocked and amazed to, to discover um, that the Quran was translated into Latin mm. in the Middle Ages. And uh, I actually used that Quran translation in my first book and then um, I just couldn't get enough of thinking about these right. Quran translations and so I eventually decided to write a book about about the process of translation from Arabic into Latin and then about the reception of those texts yes, in, so, in yeah. Western Europe. Yeah, you yeah. can see how because that project took place uh, in Spain, I think, mm -hmm. yes. that you could see the, the path that you followed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Can, can I step back for a second and just ask a more general question about, um, about the Middle Ages and our uh, approach to the Medieval Ages or the Middle Ages or Medieval period? Uh, it seems to me that, I mean, at least in contemporary American uh, civilization, culture, that there's a love-hate relationship with the medieval period. It's probably we can have another uh, episode mm -hmm. speaking just <laughs> about this question. Yeah. But you know, e even from people that um, I don't know, like haven't studied or haven't read widely, but there's still sort of the romantic notion about the medieval period, chivalry, knights, uh, and then we keep on having these like popular representations. I mean, you mentioned Lord of the Rings, but there was a Game of Thrones. Yes. Um, originally, uh, like Lord of the Rings, originally novels, and then had, um, I mean, it was a television series, not a movie, but, um, so, yeah, I mean, is, is that a fair characterization, that we have a love-hate relationship? Because we also vilify the Middle Ages as a place of, or a time and place of, of barbarism and all of that. So. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true, and, and I think uh, both are continuing on very strongly right now. Um, it's a legacy, really, of, of the early modern period when when Petrarch decided that there was such a thing as the Middle Ages and identified it as such. And that, it's an interesting case of, of the th thinking of a, uh, you know, sort of a elite uh, intellectual trickling down to everyone mm. Um, mm. over the centuries uh, that has become sort of baked into our cultural um, uh, way of understanding our past. Right. And uh, and so there is this strand that uh, we you know we still call things that are going on say in Ukraine right now medieval exactly because we exactly. Wanna, we we mean barbaric or or something like that yes but on the other hand there's still a kind of a fascination that grows out of various stra uh, strands of Western thought uh, Walter Scott and other people of mm -hmm. the Middle Ages as as somehow um, this kind of r beautiful romantic period mm -hmm. of, of, of loyalty and um, and honor and and then there's a religious strand of this as well the the sort of neo Thomas strand of Catholic thought valorizes mm -hmm. this period mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. as the world that produced Aquinas and and this great synthesis of of faith faith and and reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of these things play together to, to give us a really complicated vision of the medieval past. And I might add, that given the subject that we're talking about today, it, in some ways that's very similar to how medieval Europeans viewed the Islamic world. They, mm -hmm. had, very, uh, they had a complex kind of uh, variety of reactions to the Middle Ages or to the Islamic world. Right, some, right. some of them... Uh, uh, very negative indeed, and some of them quite positive, okay. and that that sh actually uh, showed up in the research I did about yeah. uh, the Quran and its reception. Great. Well, uh, we might re return to this. I want to get on to the next question, but I also want to make sure I mention 
that I think the work you've done, especially probably in the past 10, 10 years or so, uh, has helped um, forge a new vision of medieval studies that incorporates uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world and um, Mediterranean studies as a field. And I'm not going to ask you about that yeah. right now because then we'll go too far, yeah. too far uh, on a tangent. But I think that, that it's a really important development, at least sort of as an outsider um, looking at the developments in, in medieval studies. Uh, I wanted to ask a question I ask everyone on yeah. exploring the Quran and the Bible, which yeah. is just interests outside of academia, uh, things you like to do, hobbies, mm -hmm. Uh, things you watch, things you read. Um, yeah, what, what would yeah. you what would you say about that? Well, I, um, yeah, one of my principal interests is is just reading for fun, uh, and mm -hmm. and by that I mean um, just stuff that I enjoy and I don't feel like <coughs> I have to take notes and and uh, <laughs> be edified by necessarily. But so right now I'm reading a lot of uh, science fiction, uh, as it happens, okay. uh, recent science fiction. Um, my wife and I do do spend uh, a little time every day watching various things, uh, you know, on on all of the 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 web um, yeah streaming the, services streaming services yep. Yep. Uh, and yeah. and um, so we're watching the marvelous Mrs. Maisel in its fourth season. Okay, uh, okay, right, good right now. Yeah. So yeah. so we like that kind of thing. Uh, I. I, I do have what I, I guess would be described as a, hob, a hobby. I, I'm a I'm a woodworker, though I'm not a very good one oh. yet. Oh, that's interesting. But I yeah. do, uh, and I and I've I've made, you know, bookshelves from my home office and all that kind of thing. I kind of grew up around that kind of thing, and my father taught us how to do all these sorts of things. And at the moment, I'm trying to learn how to do. Um, Joinery with 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 only hand tools. Oh wow! And um, it turns out to be very difficult, <laughs> and I'm still not very. I'm not, I'm okay. far from being good at it, but I'm yeah. enjoying. That, uh, learning yeah, it must how be to really it. satisfying, you know, especially coming from doing the intellectual work of a professor and precisely uh, th yeah. thinking thinking important thoughts, but then to actually do something important with your hands. Yeah, yeah. it must be really. Satisfying. Or at least to do something fun. I don't know yeah. if it's important. Okay. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Well, I wanted to ask also about um, more just sort of general background question about, I usually ask about, you know, uh, who are some thinkers or what are some books you've read um, that have influenced you? Um, that's a tough question because it's so, so open-ended. Uh, so I don't know, maybe um, you could speak about uh, a book or two that you read in graduate school that was really formative in, in your own thinking about um, either medieval studies generally or the Quran and uh, in medieval yeah. year, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, uh, I would answer that by talking about a couple of things. Um, my my graduate program was a little bit odd in that we mostly read primary texts. Oh, okay. And, okay. And it wasn't so much books; it was texts that, yes. that shaped me at least uh, originally. So did you have seminars where you would read in the original languages and sort of go yes. around the table translating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, yeah, exactly. Okay. I have, I have, uh, yeah, <laughs> a difficult uh, memories of, of doing something similar. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and the thought was that well, you'd pick up the secondary scholarship on your own some okay. Point, okay. some some point, but there are certainly thinkers who um, influence me a lot. Um, I guess uh, you know, since I'm primarily primarily an intellectual historian, and though I'm a historian of of um, Christian Muslim relations and Jewish relations at the intellectual level, I'm primarily a scholar of those intellectuals in the Latin world who really knew um, Islamic texts, mm. uh, um, Arabic texts, or Jewish texts really well, and and. Mm -hmm had uh, direct access to the um, to the textual traditions of these other religions. Right. And so, um, you know, I guess I would say that as an intellectual historian of the Middle Ages, I was, I, I've, I've always found the work of a British scholar named uh, Richard Southern um, okay. extremely, okay. I love the way he writes, um, I love the way he asks questions and um, He's uh, in particularly, as for example, a book, uh, two-volume book, 
meant to be three. He, he died before he finished okay. it. Okay. Called uh, Scholastic Humanism, mm. and uh, uh, and uh, that that book, which I read many years after graduate school, came out uh, a few years after I uh, finished. Okay. Really shaped a lot of okay. how I approach my work. Interesting. But then another one, um, another scholar uh, whom I discovered only after graduate school, who uh, in many ways uh, I've um, been most influenced by in terms of how I approach the subject of studying scholars in the Middle, Age, in, in the Middle Ages, <laughs> especially those doing work on, um, on uh, difficult texts and um, in other languages is the great um, um, uh, scholar at Princeton, uh, Anthony Grafton. Okay. Um, okay. And I guess I would say I'm a Graftonian, a Graftonian. Uh, without okay. ever having studied with him. Okay. Uh, but okay. he's a lovely man and a very friendly man and, and has been uh, something of a mentor okay. yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah, when you get an adjective based on your last name. <laughs> yes. I'm sure yes. there are Bermanians. <laughs> as well. Um, uh, did, did you, maybe one more question on this, then we'll move on rapidly yeah, yeah, to the yeah, translation of the Quran yeah. uh, in the 12th century. But um, d d how did you feel like in graduate school and maybe later about uh, some of the ideas of medieval Spain as this great, great place where everyone got along? I know it's a controversial yeah. topic and there's all yeah. sorts of fights because it, it's, it's connected to certain questions of coexistence uh, today and um, but did you have like uh, I don't know a romantic notion like oh, medieval Spain was sort of like that was where people got it right Jews mm -hmm. Christians Muslims got along you know, yeah so. I, I, I no I don't think I had a romantic vision but I, I think that that had partly to do with my doctoral mentor who was obviously very influ influential on me as well J Jan Hilgarth was um, very interested in the in various pluralisms in Spain, okay. Uh, okay, not not just the religious pluralism, but also the fact that Spain was Spain was divided up into these separate countries mm -hmm. of uh, the Crown of Aragon and Castile and Portugal, and he was very insistent on seeing, um, trying to look at Spain without the um, the uh, a unified Spain as the obvious uh, result. Um, of the evolution of history, that was okay. always we were always okay. going to have a unified Spain, and he was one of these. Uh, he, he died just a, a few years ago. Um, one of these very hard-headed British um, um, historians who, um, while he certainly uh, in his really monumental work on called the medieval Spains. Um, um, really said, uh, talked a lot about the religious diversity of Spain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was never, uh, he yeah. never saw it through rosy eyes. He always okay. recognized okay. that, yes, there, there are some very impressive parts of this. There are, there's a real uh, kind of interaction that's going on here, not just at the intellectual level, but in all kinds of other ways. And there are mm -hmm, these, mm -hmm. these remarkable figures produced in that world, like Ramon Lull, who who kind of uh, bear that in their whole way of looking at life, but nevertheless, so there was trouble. There was yeah. trouble uh, <laughs> from time to time, and yeah. it could be very yeah. serious trouble. I, I show my students sometimes the Egyptian film Destiny. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one about I, Ibn Rushd or Yeah, I know yeah. of it. I've not seen it. Yeah, unfortunately. yeah. It's it's a good one to show students because I think it. Uh, well, it's connected to twentieth century Egyptian yeah. questions, actually, but. Uh, it yeah, it's a good a good way of beginning to think about so-called convivencia, the yeah. coexistence. Of, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn actually to the translation of Quran, and uh, at least what I what I've been told is that the first translation of the Quran into Latin was by a project uh, commissioned by uh, Peter the Venerable, completed in eleven forty nine. Uh, that the principal translator was a guy named um, Robert of Ketton, who I think as the name suggests, was English. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that basically right? And what are a couple of things people should know about this project? Uh, well, yeah, it, it's th that that uh, Quran translation was completed in uh, about 1143. Oh, really? Yes, and okay. Robert of Ketton was the principal translator 
at least as far as we know, uh, all of the uh, the prefaces and all uh, related documents identify him as a translator. Though, as part of the team of translators that Peter the Venerable hired to translate the Quran and other texts, we know there was a Muslim uh, named Muhammad. He's very shadowy. We don't know what role he contributed, but I mm -hmm. suspect that one of the things he did um, is, um, and I'll say more about this in a moment, is he um, assisted uh, Robert of Ketton in mastering um, at least a lot of the tradition of commentary, interesting. the Muslim interesting. commentary. So it wasn't just Quran. about reading the Arabic of the Quran, it was also about integrating insights from it, the it, tafsir it, it, or it, the commentary. Exactly, yeah. And in fact, that's one of the things I would most want to say about that translation okay. is that uh, on the one hand it was uh, and had been for uh, centuries vilified for being a paraphrase of the Quran mm -hmm. and and it is indeed it's not easy uh, is if you set it alongside the Arabic Quran it's not easy to follow uh, one to the other because he changes around the order of sentences sometimes he collapses mm -hmm. whole sentences into um, into uh, participial phrases, uh, sometimes he leaves uh, things out, but he also adds a fair amount of material, and that material overwhelmingly tends to be ident easily identifiable, really, as um, sort of supplementary information that one would find in a Quranic commentary. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I, I think it's a, a, already it's a really interesting point, because one might assume that, you know, it's the Middle Ages and people aren't really uh, working according to the standards of ma modern academic research, and one would be tempted to uh, add paraphrases and just polemical material, maybe caricature material, to make the Quran look really bad. But it's, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's just uh, things coming from the, yeah. the Islamic commentaries themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I would say is it's very rarely the case that uh, polemical material was added to this uh, translation, and and it, it, it it's it's hard to actually find material in it that clearly um, uh, is a polemical distortion. There are lots of problems with it. There okay. there are okay. there are things he got wrong. Right. Um, the Quran is a very hard book in in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's not easy to translate. And I think, or at least I have argued, that the main reason that they turn, whether directly, t uh, and not just Robert of Kenton, but later translators, turn to uh, Quranic commentaries or Quranic informants of some kind, or, or probably a combination of them, is that um, they have to do this very hard task of translating this book that um, has a lot of words that are not at all clear what they mean. <laughs> and the easiest route to take um, is go go look at a commentary. And, exactly. that, and it's a very natural yeah. act yeah. for a medieval thinker, yeah. whether anywhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, this is a world of commentary culture, and you turn to the, to the commentary to help you <laughs> figure this out. And so there are places where he clearly inserts um, uh, the kind of things you find in, in the commentary. So, so for example, in uh, um, the Surah of the Elephant, um, we have the famous or uh, notorious uh, phrase, Ter Ababil, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the flying things mm -hmm. of Ababil. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, Which is usually translated, I think, today, uh, presumably also coming from Tafsir as, uh, as flocks of birds or yeah, something Yeah, exactly, like that. Yeah. exactly. And um, Robert of Ketton came to that, that phrase, and of course that's the only time that word appears mm -hmm. in the Quran. Mm -hmm. It's probably the only time it appears in, in, in Arabic literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you would know better than me about that. But, it, I mean, it, it clearly the, when you look at the commentaries about it, they, they don't know what this means, um, and they present a lot of theories yeah. about it. Right. And one right. of the theories is precisely what you mentioned, that flocks of birds f flying in ranks. And yeah. his translation basically s takes that information and puts it right in the Latin text. Okay, okay. Um, 
there is a later translator who came to that passage, didn't consult uh, uh, an informant or a Quran commentary, yes. and translated it as the the birds of Babylon. Yeah. Ababil uh, becomes it, it, of yeah, Babylon. It, yeah, okay. becomes Babylon. Yes. But, but Robert yes. Ketton got that and many, many, many other uh, really difficult passages correct. Okay. By who, who was that. the later translator? Uh, that's Mark of Toledo. Mark of Toledo. Who, okay. who, who also used uh, Quranic commentaries, but not... Not in, not in Quran 105, yeah, yeah, or at least yeah, in his yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's funny because there's, there's so few place names in the Quran. Yes. You have Surat, Surat Arum, so, yeah. so there's a reference to the Byzantines, but I mean, there's, there's so few actual place names other than maybe Yathrib, Medina, that yeah. does appear. Uh, even Jerusalem isn't referred to by name, so that he would think, oh, this is a reference to, yeah, <laughs> to finally, Babylon. Yeah, finally a place. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, why did, what was behind the project? Why, why was Peter interested in commissioning this? And, yeah. Well, it, this is very clearly uh, um, a project that, that had a polemical or apologetic goal okay. to it. He is very clear in his letters about this that he wants to have this material, the Quran plus other texts, including the Apology of Al-Kindi and, and other texts translated into Latin, so that Latin, what he calls Latinitas, the Latin world, uh, will have access to materials to help them understand Islam and to combat it. And in fact, uh, curiously, he, um, having having overseen these translations and, and gathered them together, he sent a letter to Bernard of Clairvaux, who was sort of perhaps the most famous uh, intellectual of, of his day, saying, I, here I've assembled all these texts, I want you to do what Augustine did and uh, you know, write a, a, a full refutation of, mm. um, of Islam. And, and Bernard did not do that, in fact, uh, I've never heard that. It's yeah, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and um, it's not until much, much later, in fact, that centuries later, that European intellectuals um, actually begin to, on a large scale, uh, address Islam. Um, mostly the people who address Islam are kind of marginal figures. It's very um, interesting. Yeah, uh, for, yeah. for a long time. There's a, there's a long period of time when Islam is is um, kind of un. Uh, one European Latin culture tended to avert its gaze from the Islamic world, and <laughs> um, it's only really in the 15th century, I think, when we have what we would think of as relatively mainstream Northern European intellectuals like Dennis the Carthusian and especially Nicholas of Cusa. Mm. Who write extensively about Islam mm. the, in the scholastic, the early scholastic period? Almost nobody pays it any attention. But this is a time when I mean, how do we explain that, right? Because this is a time when, certainly in Spain, but also in the East, uh, you know, there's um, there's constant engagement between yeah. between Muslims and Christians. Obviously, in the Islamic world, Christians have been. Um, uh, you know, living in uh, in Islamic society for centuries, but I mean, uh, the the Latin West is engaging with Islam sometimes through battle, but sometimes through trade, sometimes through intellectual interchange, uh, in the you know the the Crusader states in the East, and uh, for a while in Southern Italy, yeah. and certainly in Spain and Portugal. So, how can you uh, be so much in contact with another civilization, but? Um, you know, not not show great interest in uh, religion, which sort of, in some ways, is omnipresent in that civilization. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's a you know, it makes absolute sense, and and it's one of the questions that I'm, I'm currently uh, trying to uh, address in a, another book project that I'm working on about the great 13th century um, um, disputationalist uh, um, uh, Ramon Martí, uh, mm -hmm. Dominican, who who uh, is the, really the greatest linguist in, in medieval Europe between the time of Jerome and, and the 17th century, knows Arabic, knows Aramaic, knows Hebrew all ex extremely well. Um, and he's usually been thought of as, as a, 
uh, a, a polemicist equally interested in Islam and Judaism. But in fact, if you look at the corpus of his writings, he wrote very little about Islam, <laughs> and only early in his career. And then he spent the rest of his uh, uh, scholarly career, 20 years, writing at vast length about Judaism. And, and, and all this in, in Spain. And you think, here, here's a Dominican, a member of the Order of the Preachers, who, right, right, who right. were meant to preach the gospel everywhere. Yes. And Islam is kind of a second thought to him. And I, and I think that's kind of uh, ex uh, uh, representative of that period, that on the one hand, yes, they're so influenced by Arab thought. And, and Marti is a good example. He's, his favorite philosophers are Arab philosophers. It's very clear. Um, but uh, at the very same time, um, rather unwilling to take the religion of Islam very seriously. Um, and I think it may be precisely because uh, uh, they've taken on board so much Arab thought in the, in the way of philosophy mm -hmm. that they have to keep um, uh, a certain level of separate too, separation. Too comfort, right? It's a little bit too close to, yeah. if you take all this stuff on, why, what would happen if you really took the religion seriously? Right, right. Right. Um, and I think that's perhaps part of the, the concern. But there are other reasons as well. There, it's very clear that um, some 13th century uh, uh, very important figures think that um, you can't really do anything about Islam. So uh, Humbert of uh, Romans... Hmm. Um, Be one, because Muslims won't convert to Christianity? Because Muslims that's won't convert. Issue. Yeah, okay. he, and he okay. actually says this. He, he, he was the... Uh, leader of the Dominican order in the 13th century, and okay. he actually says it's we, we shouldn't even bother with okay. Muslims because they won't convert. Okay. Whereas so, Jews might, I mean, in the case it, of Raymond Marti, maybe that explains part of his. It, it, yeah, it, it, yeah it, that, that might well be. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still not sure about that part of it, but okay. but um, okay. but yeah, that's absolutely the case. That okay. that and 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 so we have this uh, here we here we're starting to see these complicated attitudes toward the Islamic world. On the one hand, um, Europeans are enthralled with Arab thought, and, mm. and that's clear in all kinds of, mm. of ways. And we, you know, we, did, we just have to browse a little bit in Thomas Aquinas to see how um, the, the degree to which he's mm -hmm. an amazingly Arab thinker. Uh, mm -hmm. his, many of his most important insights come from Arab philosophy. Uh, which he doesn't hide, you know. He he says, you know, he he quotes Avicenna and Averroes mm. re it, repeatedly in his works, mm. Mm. Um, and and some of his most important insights uh, come come from Ibn Sina especially, um, that shape all of his thought. Um, at the same time, we have a kind of a fascination with Islamic aesthetic. Because uh, there's all kinds of beautiful goods being imported into right, Europe right, from right. the Islamic world, and so this is the period, precisely the period when we first start to see the so-called pseudo Kufic or fake Arabic mm. as uh, artistic motif. Mm. We see it in in paintings. We see it in in the, the nimbus of um, of the Virgin Mary fairly often, a mm. band of pseudo Kufic. Um, Islamic civilization was sort of the really cool uh, advanced civilization that Europeans wanted to emulate. And yet at the same time, there's another strand that is fairly hostile to Islam, and, and it's possible to fall back on that hostility right. when right. one wants to. And it's also possible to um, assume a mode of, uh, of disinterest. Uh, okay. In, and, okay. And, you know, I... We can give somewhat contemporary examples, I think. I mean, um, having been educated in, uh, for graduate school in Canada, I'm amazed at the fact that Canada is this gigantic country right next to America. It's the biggest trading partner, and Americans yes. are utterly uninterested. <laughs> uh, you know, so it, it is possible to for a whole culture to yes. not... Um, 
to somehow yeah. collectively not really pay attention. Ignore your neighbor. Ignore your neighbor. <laughs> to ignore your neighbor. Yeah. Well, it, I wonder how this plays out specifically in regard to the Quran. So yeah. if we circle back to Robert's translation and maybe Mark of Toledo's translation as well, which is early 13th century now, right? Mark yes. of Toledo. Yes. Uh, I think around 1210, 1211. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, did they ever uh, sort of show their hand? Do they... Um, give hints of their own assessment of the Qur'an, um, either of its literary or aesthetic qualities or its religious message. Um, does that come out in their translation or maybe through other things they've written on yeah. the margins or in other works? Or Well, it's an interesting situation. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, um, Norman Daniel observed, uh, you know, 50 years ago in his seminal book, that's a seminal book for my book, for hmm. me as well, Islam in the West, The Making of an Image, okay. published first in 1960, so um, 60 years ago, um, um, that, as he put it, having translated the Quran in both cases, you know, relatively faithful, faithfully, uh, you know, recognizing that there are errors, there are some kinds of systematic errors in, in these translations. They basically attempted to mm -hmm. to translate fairly, I don't know, we might say honestly, the text that was in front of them. But then they both felt the need in their prologues that they wrote afterwards to distance themselves from Islam. Okay. And, then they, okay. and then they adopt a very hostile kind of mode in talking about Islam. Um, but there are there's other so so the other things they wrote tend to fall back on that that vocabulary of hostility. Okay. But there are some other surprising things that are worth taking note of, and especially I think uh, in the case of Robert of Ketton, because um, in paraphrasing the Quranic text, uh, he wasn't just um, playing fast and loose with it. He was actually translating the high status saj of of the Quran, mm -hmm. the kind of rhyme prose of the Quran, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. into a different but equally high status Latin. That's very uh, interesting. Uh, I yeah, never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that he the Latin he produces is full of the kinds of literary uh, figures that contemporary. Um, guides to, to really good style recommended. So um, he uses a, a, a lot of uh, parallel construction, um, uses a lot of um, um, uh, sort of uh, sophisticated, balanced, Ciceronian kind of phrasing, mm -hmm. all of these kinds of things, making it actually of all of the Quran translations in some ways the hardest to read mm. because it's... Mm. It, Often very long periodic sentences okay, okay. that keep often collapsing yeah, a number yeah. of verses into a, yeah. a long kind of Ciceronian. Thing. That's very interesting. And so yes. I've I've argued that what he was doing is what translation scholars call dynamic mm. uh, translation. Yes. Uh, trying to trying to you can't do the rhymed prose no. in Latin because that's not what Latin does. But you do something else that has the same kind of status. Very and that to me suggests that. He felt that the Quran was a high status text and it deserved a high status format in in Latin. Mark Mark doesn't do this, and later translators, for the most part, don't. They tend to translate quite literally, mm -hmm. um, often following the word order very carefully, mm -hmm. which also leads to weird Latin because it's Latin written in Arabic uh, word order, word order. <laughs> um, which can work because Latin can be written in a lot of different orders because but, it's inflected. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's inflected. But uh, so I think there's uh, there uh, he he tips his hand in that way, showing that he has uh, s some complex uh, attitudes toward the Quran, having having explored it very carefully from a philological sense as he translated it, having explored it uh, from the context of Islam by by interacting with the tradition of Quranic commentary, and then by putting it in this uh, high status Latin. That's a fairly complex set of attitudes to have, and we see uh, complex attitudes in other ways in in the reception of these texts. 
um, uh, later on, especially in the 15th century and the 16th century, we begin to see copies of the Quran in Latin that are beautiful presentation copies, mm. not just many of the earlier ones are just very run-of-the-mill manuscripts that, that copy out the text. But okay. We, okay. we begin to see beautiful Latin Qurans that have illuminations, uh, beautiful script, are very carefully made, um, and um, that uh, a friend of mine once when I was giving a presentation about some of these said are a little bit like uh, the, the Penguin Classics version of the Quran that sort of present it as a treasure of world literature. Treasure of world literature. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have up there on one of the shelves uh, a translation of the Quran, not done by Penguin, but it's um, it's really intriguing. I can show it to you afterwards. Yeah, okay, I'll look forward to <laughs> because it. it it has illuminations and it even represents Muhammad figuratively, yeah. so that would never be done, obviously, in, in uh, most of Islamic society. Um, so, uh, but in doing so, it obviously it wants to make the text beautiful, exactly as sort of a treasure yeah. of world, yes. of world literature, and has uh, the kind of calligraphic uh, flourishes here and there, which are meant to represent something of Arabic calligraphy. Obviously, it's an well, we, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that that the whole uh, in one particular case. And it's Robert of Catton's Quran that is copied, and this is copied in about 1516, okay. this manuscript. Um, it very carefully copies the text in a, a hand called humanist cursive, which is the direct ancestor of what we call italics. You know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it, in Renaissance manuscripts of that period, there is very often a distinction made huh. based on the alphabet that, or the, the hand you use. So what we might think of as churchy texts, the yes. Vulgate, yes. Uh, uh, scholastic theology and canon law, were still copied in the Gothic script of okay. the High Middle Ages. Okay. But classical texts mm -hmm. tended to be copied in humanist uh, book hand or humanist cursive. And so here's a version of the Quran put in humanist cursive, and the humanist cursive kind of communicating this is a classical a classic. That's very interesting. Classical text. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking also in terms of the question of a di dynamic translation, this is a major debate among contemporary translators of the Qur'an. And, uh, I mean, the translations are, uh, for better or for worse, uh, uh, abundant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a relatively short text. Lots yeah. of people know Arabic, so they feel like they translate the Qur'an. Yeah. They tend to sell well. So uh, there's just translations yeah. every single year in English. Uh, you know, there are new translations that are, are coming out. And so there's all sorts of... Um, contention over, you know, how do you do this to try to represent something of the Quran's um, literary qualities in English. Uh, one of the scholarly translations that I really like is by Arthur Droge, and his approach is basically to let the source language show forth, mm -hmm. which r means that the, the English translation is abrasive sometimes mm -hmm. because of questions of word order or literal translations of Arabic words, you know, where he doesn't seek to find an equivalent English idiom. Yes. Uh, so I, I kind of like that. But then, you know, another uh, really interesting project is done by someone named Shokat Turawa, whom, whom you know, yes. uh, now at Yale University. And he's published a number of surahs translated into rhymed English. Oh, wow. No, I which, didn't know that. Yeah, it was That's a real feat, too. Yeah. It's not in, not yeah, easy yeah, to yeah, do. No. Uh, but And he says, listen, rhyme is so fundamental to the experience of mm -hmm. absorbing the Quran in Arabic mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, at least someone should try. Yes. <laughs> someone should try to do it in English. Yes. So, well, I wanted to ask uh, uh, some more specific questions about um, maybe not Robert or, and Mark in particular, but generally medieval Latin approaches to the Quran. Um, and, I mean, one way of getting at that is just speaking about dispositions towards Islam, um, but also the Quran in, in, in particular. I mean, do you think people like Peter, I don't have to use this example, maybe there are others you'd like to speak about. Did, did they think of Muslims, what is a category? Did they think of Muslims as fellow monotheists that had a scripture that's basically analogous to the Bible? Of course, they would say it's not the word of God, but same kind of thing, like same kind of thing going on as Christians yeah. in the Bible. Uh, did they have other, you know, hostile categories in which to label them? Uh, how does that play out? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, 
I think in general, and I think this is in gen generally true of the Mediterranean world and of Europe, most of the time, um, Christians and Muslims recognize each other as fellow monotheists and, and Jews as well. I mean, and, and we even have texts uh, that uh, uh, one by the great uh, Jewish thinker Sadia uh, Gaon. Uh, Gaon, who actually talks about the community of monotheists. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course, there was language in the Islamic tradition that you could you could fall back on that accuses Christians of being polytheists. And so Ibn Hazm, for example, sometimes uses one way of thinking about Christians that they are monotheists, but in other places can be unstinting about they're, mm. they're really polytheists. But for the most part, the tendency was for all of them to see each other as monotheists. And certainly that's the, that's the general understanding in the Christian world. Um, okay. Uh, in, in, uh, relatively learned circles that 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 uh, Muslims are fellow monotheists who um, um, just have some things wrong and, okay, and okay. in some cases uh, someone might say they have a lot of things wrong and in some some cases not not many um, and we can see this in um, the way, that, in certain aspects of the language that they use, they do. In fact, there's this been the, been this debate in religious study circles about whether their the category of religion um, exists before the early modern period, because the word religio in the Middle Ages doesn't mean religion the way it does now. Okay. But in point of fact, there were other terms that were used. What were those terms in Latin? In Latin, the, primarily the word lex mm -hmm. or secta. Okay, uh, lex meaning law. Uh, okay. And in, and in uh, sometimes fides okay. uh, could be faith. used this, this way, faith, yeah. But especially lex could be used this way. And okay. so writers okay. often speak of, Ramon Lul is a good example of this, the lex um, Judeorum, the Lex mm. Christianorum, and the Lex uh, Saracenorum, mm. uh, or Lex Saracenica, and uh, and it's very clear in the context that he's seeing them as as equivalent in having uh, the same kind of monotheism, the, yeah. the holy text. Just, just to, to translate the Le the Lex Saracenorum would be the, the literally law the law of, of the, the Saracens. Saracens, but the Saracen is the the standard word. That they use for Muslim okay. until late, the very late Middle Ages, when when Turk becomes oh, uh, okay. The, okay. the word that is used, yeah. um, and uh, and they also, uh, by the way, uh, use terms like Judaismus and oh. Saracenismus, Judaism and Saracenism. Okay. Uh, okay. So they they clearly can think of religion in a generic sense, and they have generic words. Okay. Uh, to identify them, and uh, yeah, uh, we have we do have texts from the medieval European world that that uh, brand Muslims as polytheists as well. Uh, but these are overwhelmingly the Chanson de Geste, uh, mm. a kind of uh, literature intended f for entertainment for in courtly circles, where there's a whole invented kind of Islam. Okay. Um, okay. That we that far appears, far removed from reality. Very, very far <laughs> removed. But uh, but among scholars who knew anything about Islam, yes, they were seen as monotheists, and it it, it this has made me, um, I don't know, at least be amused at if uh, uh, sometimes annoyed about these whole all these discussions in modern um, recent times, uh, <laughs> where where in evangelical circles people have been <laughs> arguing that. That that uh, Christians and Muslims don't believe in the same God. Right, right. No one doubted that in the Middle Ages yes. that I that I can see. I've never yes. seen anybody doubt yes. that. Uh, and I mean, as a rule, at, at least in the Arab world today, it's, it's Allah. Yeah, exactly. It's just no, Allah. No, no, no. It's, it's the same term. <laughs> we all worship exactly. Allah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's it's almost a ridiculous yeah. uh, question. Yeah. No, um, no, no. I agree yeah. entirely. Yeah. Um, so. So. Uh, they do see them as fellow monotheists. Um, they um, 
not to the extent that is common among Arab Christians. They don't they don't go quite so far as saying, well, uh, Muhammad was as a prophet perfectly fine. He just wasn't a prophet for us. He was a prophet for mm-hmm. for meant for a particular community. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can follow that too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, precisely. Yeah. Uh, um, but um, some some European thinkers are convinced that the way to appeal to Muslims is and Raman Bull is the best example of this is by emphasizing that they do have faith um, in the same God that we have, and all they need is is to see that the basic monotheistic faith that, that they have, uh, if you follow it to its logical conclusions, would lead you to become a Christian. And he, he believes that he has, well, he had revealed to him a whole theological, philosophical system that would do that without, without forcing anybody to debate over what a particular scripture mm. says. Um, so there were some European thinkers who were quite accommodating to the idea that Islamic faith was legitimate up to a, quite a substantial point. Mm. Others were much less so. Right. But um, um, among the intellectuals, no one doubted that they were monotheists. Okay, yeah. okay. Do you know, I'm sort of putting you on the spot here, but... Uh, the, the words, uh, so one of the interesting things about calling Islam, Islam, yeah. is that uh, this is an Arabic word, yeah. um, uh, which, as, as uh, many know, means submission, and uh, it appears in the Quran, mm-hmm. you know, in the deen and Allah and Islam. You know, oh, I just use the word deen, which yeah, re- yeah, just yeah, means yeah, my religion. So yeah. religion, uh, God's religion is Islam. Yeah. Okay? And you hear that, and you think, oh, this is declaring Islam with a capital I as the true religion. Yeah. Many Muslims would go that route, right? But it could also be uh, God's religion, if religions are a translation, yeah, yeah. is to, to be submissive to be, or to submit. Yeah. So um, how, how, do, uh, how are those tran- words translated, if you know, uh, wow. with Robert or... Not, not the Dean part, uh, yeah. that might be Lex, but yeah. uh, Islam, Muslims, do, do you know how Robert, Mark, or others deal with that word in the Quran? I'm pretty sure that, uh, I can't say this with confidence, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the Saracenismus would be the way they would translate is, is Islam in that case, okay. that they would read it as... Not, not as the, the Latin equivalent of submission, that, uh, whatever, submission, whatever that is. No, okay. that, that, okay. that's... I could check on that, yeah. but um, um, yeah. uh, I'm not sure if I have my head. Right, okay, okay. Um, so I want to turn, as we're sort of moving to yeah. the end now, we've got about five minutes left, I want to turn a little bit to uh, contemporary controversies over over this question. Gosh, I had this rough idea that uh, scholarship really emphasized the polemical nature of medieval uh, European engagement with the Quran until recently, and now there's a more nuanced approach saying, well, there's positive and negative. I mean, you've been speaking about actually yeah. the... Um, general fidelity of at least uh, uh, of Robert's project in mm-hmm. translation of the Quran um, and his interest in uh, I mean you've written about this in your your book about uh, in Islamic commentary uh, is that a general trend in scholarship um, they're going from oh no all the medieval Europeans were hostile towards the Quran and now no it's more complicated uh, some of them actually like the Quran or h- how does it work out the debate today among scholars I would say, uh, yeah, I would say it's largely been accepted that there is um, a more complex set of attitudes toward Islam than um, one than than typically you would have found in scholarship of fifty years ago. Um, though even then, um, you know, uh, Robert uh, Richard Southern, the same scholar I mentioned earlier, wrote mm-hmm. a short little book about. Um, about Christian attitudes toward Islam also in the very early 60s. And, you know, he pointed out that there's some nuance uh, as well, but I think it's become much more widely accepted. That has to do with uh, at, at least one thing, and that is the way in which um, the Mediterranean, whole Mediterranean world has been embraced um, as part of the project of medieval studies, uh, right and right. Um, 
and the huge interest right now in things you know like intersectionality and and like uh, religious pluralism have meant that there are lots of people looking at what 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 goes on on the ground and we have we have places where we can really track very carefully what the relationships were like um, especially in eastern Spain in the Middle Ages because we have rich documentation that you know people can write very uh, remarkably detailed social histories of the interaction between Christians and Muslims and Jews and and it's very clear that from from this kind of work that yeah the, um, there were three communities that were sometimes hostile to each other uh, but that they interacted together all in manifold ways in the same marketplaces particularly um, but uh, we know from lots of sources that um, that uh, religious uh, pious or re uh, religious uh, officials um, were very upset about the fact that people were taking their friends to church, their Muslim friends to church, that um, that Christians were enjoying the same um, uh, religious celebrations as Muslims, uh, that um, that the boundary lines that some of the elite religious thinkers wanted to draw uh, between these communities were crossed okay. uh, very regularly. Okay. We know that they had business partnerships with each other. Um, we have, you know, we have the documents that show this. Uh, yes. We, we yes. have, we have actually commender contracts that yes. that that demonstrate this. Um, and and then you know, and then we have things like. Uh, Literary sources that, and I mentioned the Chanson de Geste uh, a moment ago, mm -hmm. that portray Saladin, for example, as as like the most noble knight um, that ever lived. Um, his reputation was enormously. Um, he, uh, he was welcomed, or sort of the image of him was welcomed as this model of knightly virtue. So there's just lots of kinds of evidence from different kinds of scholarly uh, inquiries that that make clear that sure there was always um, a language of hostility that you could invoke against Islam, and it was invoked quite quite frequently. Uh, but there were very other kinds of ways of imagining Islam and interacting with it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it so, so so when when you uh, right in reading the Quran in Latin Christendom, that actually is pretty interesting analyzing how Robert and Mark uh, engage with the Quran. Mm -hmm. They have these polemical prologues, but they're really engaging with the text, especially Robert yeah. maybe with his concern for the beauty of the Latin yeah. or the high register of the Latin. Uh, did people respond? Were there book reviews or maybe informal responses like, uh, you're overdoing it. Uh, these guys were all, you know, sort of Islamophobes, even mm -hmm. though the term didn't yeah. exist at the time, filled with, uh, I don't know, ho hostility, trying to vilify. Yeah. Did, did yeah. people respond negatively to the nuance you give to this translate these translation projects? Um, well, the very first review I read of <laughs> of uh, reading the Quran in Latin Christendom did do this. It, it, it was quite hostile and said, oh, this is an overly rosy picture of all okay. of this. And, okay. and, and, and in fact, um, you know, there's no way that, that medieval Christians could have this, this kind of nuanced vision. But if, if every other review, that, at least that I looked at, um, um, was, um, seemed, to, seemed to accept the arguments mm -hmm. I'd made there. And, um, and in general, the book was, uh, I'm gratified to say, quite quite well received, and and uh, won a couple of awards, and and um, uh, has uh, uh, been cited a lot. Has been um, uh, the you know the some of the essential arguments I've made. You know that that these translators often knew the commentary tradition right, right. have been widely accepted as it comes. Okay, from. very interesting. Uh, so, yeah. so I, yeah, there was the one, and, and it had to be the first one I read, <laughs> of course, uh, that, that objected, but, but uh, no, in general, it, it, okay. it, it has, has been at least decently received. In, okay. Uh, 
Well, that's a final question I just thought I'd ask about. Uh, I, I alluded to one project that I think is ongoing yeah. for you, the Leo Omar correspondence. Yeah. But if you wanted to speak a little bit about that or other projects you have ongoing. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Well, yeah, that project, uh, yeah, a group of other scholars and I uh, have translated uh, or have edited and translated all of the versions of this pseudo correspondence between Leo and Umar and all the languages that it exists Armenian, Arabic, uh, Latin, uh, Castilian, uh, so called Al Hamiado Castilian, written in Arabic characters. Um, and we're just about to send that to a press for evaluation. Um, that's, that's been a really interesting uh, 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 project, really a lot of fun, great scholars to work with. Um, and uh, I interestingly enough, uh, uh, apropos of our conversation, um, it turns out that um, there are three in the earliest Latin version of this correspondence, which was uh, which survives in a manuscript from before 850. Um, so it's very early on indeed. Uh, this is probably the first text translated from Arabic into Latin in Andalusia. Um, there are three quotations of the Quran. Mm. And so they, along with another contemporary quotation in um, uh, uh, work from the same place are the four earliest uh, passages of the Quran that, that make it into the yeah, Latin So much tradition. earlier than Robert's Yeah, translation. exactly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then, yes, and then I've been working for um, like a decade now uh, and <laughs> unfortunately haven't got in some ways very far. In some ways I have with uh, trying to uh, trying to um, make sense of Robert, of uh, Ramon Ramon Martí's kind of striking choices about what religion to engage with and um, and turning my attention back to that um, after uh, several years of working on these other projects. Got it. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Well, I would really love to have you back. Uh, I, I would like to record an episode, uh, if I can convince you, yeah. uh, in which we look at some texts together, maybe um, so, maybe some other translations, oh, uh, maybe also a text like the Kribatsu or Korani, uh, not uh, Al-Qurani. Yeah, Kribatsu Al-Qurani. A Qurani of uh, Nicholas of Kuzak. Yeah, sure. That would be really, really great to do sure. that together. Yeah. Uh, is there an easy way if people want to um, follow your work, uh, how should they... Uh, uh, find you on on the internet or otherwise. What's the uh, well, yeah, they can find me uh, by by uh, by uh, googling Medieval Institute. Okay, I'm the director of that, uh, and uh, that's at, one at way. Notre to, Dame. At Notre Dame, okay. I also have a Twitter feed. Uh, I guess you would you'd say this is at Bob Kerr. Yes. B o b c u r. Yes. And uh, someday I'll I'll tell. The, the reason why that's my <laughs> that's that, that's my my Twitter okay. indeed. so that's another way to to follow me. Great. Uh, so yeah, Professor yeah. Berman, thank you so much. Oh, for you're being quite welcome. My, my pleasure.